And welcome back to the Cloud Church. I'm Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist to the Spanish and English speaking people. And I've got a message prepared for you today, kind of a Bible study, about what the Bible says about self defense. I've had several people email me and ask me, would you please do a, a, a Bible study on this? Because we want to know. You know, there's some Christians that think, oh no, a Christian has no right to defend himself. If someone wants to kill him or do evil to him, then he just has to sit there and say, okay, kill me. Is that what God wants? Does God desire for us as Christians to just go, okay, kill me? I don't think so. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, it tells us in many different places that it is the duty of a Christian to defend himself from someone who tries to do him wrong. So there's nothing wrong with self-defense. And what I'm going to do today is take you through the scriptures, show you from the Bible what the Bible has to say about this topic. Because uh, all over the world today, there's this great push against guns. And they want what they call gun control. And they say, oh, you shouldn't have a right to own guns. Well, do you? Does the Bible tell us that there's, that there's a right for us to un own guns? The United Nations wants to disarm the entire world. But yet, is that right according to the Bible? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at what the Bible teaches about this subject. And first of all, as I was doing this study, I said, well, you know what? The first thing I want to do is just look up in the Bible the word defense and defend and defended. And what I found is the word defense appears 22 times in 21 verses in the King James Bible. And it's spelled differently than we spell it today. Today we, just, we spell defense, D-E-F-E-N-S-E. But in Old English, the King James has some Old English still in it. It's spelled D-E-F-E-N-C-E, -E -E, so defense. Now I spelled it with an S up here. Self-defense. Uh, the word defend shows up 11 times in 11 verses in the King James Bible. The past, defended, appears two times in two verses. Defendest, the Old English defendest, appears one time in one verse. And the gerund form defending, I-N-G, appears one time in one verse. So God speaks of defense. And in the Bible there is such a thing as defense. Usually, it's God defending His people, or His people defending what belongs to them against evil others who seek to kill and to steal. So God, in heaven, gave through Abraham to certain people a land. And most of that Old Testament, I wrote up here the Old Testament and the New Testament, most of that Old Testament is about God telling the Jews, this is your land, and God gave it to Israel. And what did he give? He gave them a beautiful, wonderful city named Jerusalem. Jeru. Jerusalem. Yeah, I had it spelled right. And today, it's so sad. Today, all over the news, it's like, oh, the Jews are so evil for, for trying to take over Palestine and kick out the Palestinians. Oh, how evil are the Jews? They're colonialists. Oh, we should be anti-colonialists. The Jews are bad. Get them out. No, no. God promised way back in Genesis to Abraham that was their land. So according to the Bible, the Jews have a right to defend what is theirs. And that's all they do is they try to defend from attack by terrorists their own land. But today, it's not trendy to believe in self-defense. Today, oh, you shouldn't have any right to defend yourself. Well, once again, that's going against God in the Bible. If you get a chance, go to the Cloud Church or go to YouTube and look up a sermon I preached on what the Bible says about political correctness. Because political correctness is the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. And that's the, the goal of political correctness is to get rid of God and the Bible. Um, you get a chance also, go to the Cloud Church or YouTube and look up the message that I preached entitled, What Are Our God-Given Rights? Because in that message, I also deal with this subject. One of our God-given rights is the right to defend what's ours. Self-defense. Be able to defend our life from others who might try to take it from us. So what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible teaches self-defense. We do have a right to defend our lives and our property, according to the Bible. So let's look at that. Well, what I want to do is just basically go through the entire Bible and show what the Bible teaches about this subject. So let's go back to the very beginning. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Let's go to the very beginning. What happened in the beginning? Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. And what we find here is really revealing because it shows God, the Creator, believing in self-defense. And as a matter of fact, God, the Creator, defended 
what was his own. So if God shows by example that he believes in the right to defend what's his, and we are created in God's image, well, we actually, man fell in the, in the image of Adam now, but God created man in his image, then doesn't that prove that man has a right to defend what's his? If God defended what was his? Let's look at this. Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> I like this. I want to read verse 21 through 24. And Adam and Eve have sinned in this passage. And because of that, the Bible says in verse 21, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. God made a sacrifice of most likely a lamb and clothed them in the skin of it. And God says, I forgive you of your sin. But you have to pay. There has to be a repercussion. You reap what you sow, the Bible says. So in this life, there's going to be something that's going to happen to you because of your sin. And look at what happens. Verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So man sinned against an almighty God. And God said, now, so that he doesn't go and take of the, life, of the tree of life and live forever as a dirty, filthy sinner, I have to do something. And what did God do? He took him out of the Garden of Eden. Now, was that right? Yeah, because the Garden of Eden was made by God. And it was a place for people that weren't sinners to be. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, God said, that's it, you're out of my house. You're gone. I'm defending what's mine. And look at verse 24, how God defended what belonged to him. So he drove out, drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims. Now watch this. And a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So Adam and Eve sin, and God says, that's it, you're gone. You sinners, this is my land. This is my property. This is my garden, the Garden of Eden. You get out. And God put a cherubim with a flaming sword. What does that mean? Well, that means that God's showing, hey, look, I believe in the right to defend what's mine. Now, I'm not a good artist, so please excuse my flaming sword. It doesn't look that good. But what is it? Well, it's a, a, a flaming sword. Well, that's interesting. A flaming sword. You know what an, um, a sword is? It's an arm. In the old days, when they wanted to fight in a battle, they pull out their sword and they say, to arms! Because <laughs> an arm is a sword. Matter of fact, whenever you had a standing army, it was called an army because every one of them had an arm. So God said a flaming sword or a fire arm. <laughs> Doesn't that make sense? Today, it's all about, oh, you don't have the right to own guns. We don't believe people have the right to own guns, even though the law itself and the Constitution of the United States of America says that's a right that all men have to bear arms that shall not be infringed. And yet they say, oh, we don't believe you should have it. Well, yet, in the very beginning of the Bible, God proved that, look, when something belongs to you, you have the very right to have a fiery sword or a fire arm, to hold an arm of fire, to preserve and to keep and defend what belongs to you. So God says, look, you have a right to defend what's yours. A God-given right we have to own firearms or flaming swords to defend ourselves and our property. So that's a Bible doctrine. At the very beginning of the Bible, we see the doctrine of self-defense or the right of a person to own and defend what belongs to them, to defend their own property that belongs to them. So at the very beginning of the Bible, we see that. As we continue through the Bible, we come to a time period called the law. I'm just going to skip ahead quite a few. I, I could have gone into a lot of different stories in here. Abraham owned some things, and people came and, and took some stuff that belonged to him, and he went and got it back. He had a right to defend what belonged to him. And uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to go over here to the law and look at something under the law. Now, we are not under the law today. Uh, it's very, very important that you realize that. If you get a chance, go to the Cloud Church or go to YouTube and uh, watch the video about the difference between the law and grace. We're over here in this time period called grace. And we're not saved by the law. So the Old Testament law was for two things. It was a law in the Old Testament for salvation. If a person wanted to be saved in the Old Testament, they had to keep the law. But it was also a law for society, to keep society just and moral. Well, today we're not saved by the law, so we're not saved by the Old Testament law.
But that Old Testament law has a lot of different rules and regulations that God said, this is how you ought to do things. So when they founded the United States of America, they realized the government is never to be involved in the salvation of souls. So they said, we don't take the Old Testament law for salvation, but we will take things from that Old Testament law for society. And so they said, we're going to take some of the Old Testament law. And the United States of America was founded on the Old Testament law as a government set up for the people, by the people, of the people. And the basis of the law of that society was the Old Testament. Why? Because the Old Testament is to tell us what transgression is. It tells us right from wrong. And so they took many of those principles of the Old Testament and said, we're going to make those and base our laws on those for society. So I had a guy email and, and say, well, you're trying to cut people back under the law, and yet you preach against the law when you were preaching on your, your sermon of God-given rights. Not, no, I wasn't. I want you to see the difference. The law for salvation is dead today. We are no longer under the law. That is, we're not saved by the law. We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And Romans 10 4 says, Christ is the end of the law for all who believeth. We're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And even though that law is done away for salvation, that law tells us what's right from wrong. So for society to have a government that's just, they need to look at that law and say, well, what does God say is just and what does God say that's not just? And so there are things in that Old Testament law that many of the laws of America are from that Old Testament law. So we get our laws from that. Now, what's one of the laws that we have? Well, many uh, states in the United States of America have laws of self-defense, that a person has a right to defend themselves. Where did they get that from? From the Bible, from the Old Testament law. And let me show you that. Exodus chapter 22, verses 2 and 3. If a thief be found breaking up, now that means entering into a house, most of the houses in those days in the city were made out of adobe, and in order to break in, you break the adobe, so you're breaking it up. A lot of times they would dig down in the dirt that wasn't as hard, and so they call it breaking up because they dig a hole under and they come up inside the house. And so it says, If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. If the sun be risen, risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he should be sold for his theft. So here we have a person that breaks into a person's house, a home invader. And the Bible says in other places under that law, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And so under that law, if that man breaks into that house and gets away and he's captured, verse 3 says full restitution should be made. And then he's sold as a, as a slave for his theft. That's what his penalty should be. But if he breaks into someone's house and someone through self-defense kills that person because they're scared to death that he's there to kill them or to steal from them, it says there shall no blood be shed for him. In other words, it's not murder. It's self-defense and it's justified. So if a person breaks into your house... You have every right to pick up your flaming sword, to pick your firearm, and say, get out of my house. Don't make me do this. Get away. Why? Because the guy is there to kill you, and you have a right to take out that threat to preserve your own life. Sadly, in other countries around the world, you don't have that right. You go over to England, you go over to the countries, they say, no, you don't have a right to, to defend yourself or your property. If a guy breaks into your house, they say, well, then you need to run out the front door as fast as you can. What? That goes against the very nature of man, which is to defend what belongs to him. And throughout the world, they're passing laws against God and the Bible, and they're going against this old law, which is a great, great uh, place to look for laws of modern society, because many of the laws in the Old Testament are righteous and just. It is righteous, it is just for a man to defend himself and to keep himself from being killed. To tell someone otherwise is to, to be aiding and abetting a crime. To tell someone you have no right to defend yourself when someone attacks you is to be on the side of the attacker rather than on the side of the victim. And that's what this law is all about, is that the victim has a right to defend his life and to keep himself from harm. So there's an interesting verse. Let's go to Exodus chapter 32. 
You see, all throughout the Old Testament, a man had a right to carry a sword. And he had a right to defend himself. So the right to have something to defend yourself with. You take away that right, take away what a person has to defend themselves, you're just as bad as the murderer. The person that kills them, and you're a part of it because you took from them what they could have used to defend their life. Um, Exodus chapter 32, verse 27. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side. I'm not going to read any more there. But look at what it says. The Lord God of Israel, God the Creator, told the man there, Let every man have his own sword and have it by his side. The Constitution of the United States of America says, You have the right to bear arms. So, in most states, they say, well, you have to have a concealed carry license. Okay, well, either way, you have a right to carry that. But the license, really, according to the Bible, is the Word of God. <laughs> because the Word of God is the license to have a sword or a firearm with you. So, according to the Bible, there is a right for self-defense. Look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23. In 2 Samuel chapter 23... It's an interesting verse. We see a man who was um, one of David's soldiers. And look what it says about him. You know, after this Trayvon Martin shooting, there was a lot of people who says, Well, should we have a stand your ground law? Is there such a thing as a stand your ground law? Does a person have a right to stand their ground when a person is an aggressor that's trying to kill them? Uh, well, let's just read what the Bible says. 2 Samuel 23, 11. And after him was Shema, Shema, the son of Agi, the Hagarite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop, where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philippines. And this guy, Her Shema, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. Here's the stand your ground law. Here's a guy that was being attacked by all these evil people that wanted to kill him, and he said, no, I'm standing my ground. And the Lord, the Bible says, won a great victory. Those Philistines died, and he survived. Why? Self-defense. And God says, I agree with that. That's all right. That's all right. So, according to the Bible, you have a pattern over and over and over and over in the Word of God that men have a right to self-defense, the right to own a sword, or today, the equivalent, a gun, and have a right to stand up and stand their ground and say, no one can come against me with violence, no one can kill me, no one can come after me and do evil. I have a right to defend my life and my property. Sadly, many governments throughout the world are trying to take away that right. And to do so is criminal. Because not only is it anti-biblical, it also helps criminals. You know, they want to put all these gun laws on the books. And that's fine, whatever. But you know, it's not going to deter a criminal. If a criminal wants a gun, he's not going to go, Well, I wonder what the law says, and whether I should follow that or not. He's going to say, to heck with the law, I'm going to go get a gun and I'm going to kill somebody. He's going to do, it doesn't matter how many laws there are, a criminal is going to be a criminal. And what's sad is the more laws you, you put on the books and make it harder for people to follow God in the Bible by being able to defend themselves, it almost seems like you're part of the problem. <laughs> because you're helping the criminals and you're making harder for the law-abiding citizens to defend themselves. So who's the criminal? Who's the criminal? Good question. Now let's look at Jesus' time, okay? Here's the ministry of Jesus. In Jesus, in his earthly ministry, you remember he had 12 disciples. And those 12 disciples, even after the ministry of Jesus, went out and preached. Well, what did Jesus... Who is Jesus, by the way? God, the Creator. God manifested in the flesh. What did Jesus say about this? In Luke chapter 22, verses 35 through 38... Jesus Christ is speaking, and look at what he says. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. Then said he unto them, But now, he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. God's commands, God, God manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ, commands his disciples to buy a sword. Now watch this. This is the cool part. 
in verses 36. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. So in a group of 12 people, well, 13 if you include Jesus, two of them had swords. Now that would be enough for two people to, de to defend the other 11 people. And Jesus Christ is speaking God. And he tells them, he commands them, go buy a sword. Well, there's many Christians today that say, oh, oh it's evil to have a gun. Guns are evil. Christians shouldn't have guns. When I was in Honduras, that, that was something I heard all the time from Christians. Oh, Christians shouldn't own guns. Christians shouldn't have guns. And I said, well, what did Jesus say? Let's look at this verse. And then they go, wow. You see, there's nothing wrong with owning a gun. There's nothing wrong with having a sword. There's nothing wrong with having a weapon if the intent is self-defense. And that's what the intent is for Christians. Christians don't want to go out and kill people in cold blood. Now, there's another religion that calls itself uh, submission. A another religion that, that parades as a religion, but it's not. It's a, it's a uh, governmental setup that says, oh, you can get to paradise if you kill people. And so strap on this bomb and go blow up non-believers and infidels and you'll go to heaven with 49 virgins. That's not God. That's not the Bible. God never told us that the reason we have a right to bear arms is to go just kill people for no reason. God says to get the sword and to keep it for self-defense. Interesting thing here. When Jesus Christ was speaking, he lived in the time of the Roman Empire. And the law, according to the Roman Empire, was that an average person had no right to own a sword. The law of the Roman Empire was only soldiers are allowed to, to carry swords. So here Jesus Christ gives a command to his disciples to buy a sword when it was against the law in that time, the law of the Romans, to do so. Wow, what does that tell you? Well, that tells you that Jesus Christ felt so strongly that this self-defense right is a right that God gave that he said, I don't care what man says. Their laws aren't my laws. My law, Jesus Christ, God the Creator, is you go buy a sword because you have a right to defend yourself from evil doers. Wow. Wow. So God, manifest in the flesh, told them to get a sword. Now listen, I'm not anti-government. This message is not being preached today to tell people to go fight against a corrupt government. I don't want that. I'm telling you that the Bible says you have a right to defend yourself. And that's what this message is about. The right to bear arms is a biblical right, a God-given right. It's something that God says you have a right to do is defend yourself. Sadly, many governments, and even this one in America, are trying to take away that right. And if they do, you've got to decide, okay, who am I going to follow? Rome or God? Mystery Babylon or the Lord Jesus Christ? <laughs> All I know is that I've got a book called the Bible, and I believe it. That other religion I mentioned earlier, they have a book too. They call the Koran. And you know what they do? They go all over the world and they infiltrate countries. And then they say, well, we don't care what your law is. Our law is what we follow. We follow the Koran. But yet, when you're a Christian and you say, well, no, 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 I follow the Bible and I'm older than that religion. We go back to Jesus almost 2,000 years ago. They go back to Muhammad 700 and 800 AD. So we're actually older. So why can't we do the same thing as Christians? Why can't we say, well, your laws are against our book, so as Christians we follow this and not that? It's so weird, isn't it? But yet, in America, they're allowing these people to come in and set up Sharia law, and then they're saying, oh, no, no, that you can have your own law against our law. That's fine. But when a person says, but I'm a Christian, and the Bible says, they say, shut up! Shut up! You have to follow our law, you stupid, crazy person! It leaves a Christian going, stupid, crazy. Wait a minute. They're the ones that are doing all these acts of terror, like Paris. They're the ones that are murdering people. They're the ones that have a book called the Koran that says they have a right to murder people in cold blood. And if they do, they'll go to paradise with a bunch of virgins. And yet here I am a Christian. I have a religion of peace. I have a religion that teaches me, don't go out and murder people, but also don't let them murder you. Just defend yourself. And I'm the bad guy? I don't... What? Huh? One preacher said years ago, he said, the problem with America is it's an insane asylum run by the inmates. 
America was founded on God and the Bible. And they chose that Old Testament law and says that's a good law for society. We're going to follow that. Well, I believe if you're following the Constitution and you're following the Bible, then you're doing nothing wrong. And so it's not wrong to own a gun. The problem is, they want you to think that the gun is evil. How is a gun evil? It's an inanimate object. How can an inanimate object do evil? And so there's a propaganda campaign, a smear tactic, if you will, to make people afraid of guns. Well, you know, I'm not afraid of guns. I like guns. <laughs> guns are cool. What I don't like is the people that want to use them to kill me. So what do I believe? I believe that the Bible teaches that we ought to have a right to defend ourselves. Now I'm going to tell you a story that I hate this story. I don't really like telling this story, but it's a story that it happened to me when I was in Honduras as a missionary. I went, I went to the house of another missionary there in San Pedro Sula, Honduras. And we were in there talking and we were working on my truck and two guys came in and they had a gun. And they robbed us at gunpoint. And I remember looking down the barrel of that gun as it was pointed right to my head. And they told me, look, we're going to take everything you have, get down. And as a Christian, I had no choice. I don't have a gun on me to defend myself, so the only thing I could do was preach the gospel to those people. And that's what I did. And I remember one had a tattoo here. They were evil, evil gang members. But they were using their guns for evil. And here I had nothing to defend myself with. Now, who's the victim? Well, I am, right? And these guys, they said, we're going to kill you. And because I think they didn't kill us, it was because I preached the gospel to them. And I remember telling them, look, if you shoot me, you're doing me a favor. You're sending me straight to heaven because I'm a Christian. But I want to know, are you saved? Are you on your way to heaven? Do you know Jesus Christ? Because you're not going to get to heaven if you're a sinner and you're not saved. And if you kill me... I said, man, that'd be awesome, because I know that I'm saved. I can't wait to go to heaven. And luckily, they didn't kill us. They took me into the bedroom. They put me down on my knees. They put the gun right to the back of my head. And I remember with my eyes closed praying, well, Lord, don't let them miss, because the last thing I want is to feel any pain. And the last thing I heard was slam, as they slammed the door and ran away. Cowards. They didn't even have enough guts to pull the trigger. And I was okay with it. I was ready to go. I'm a Christian. After that, I carried a gun everywhere I went in Honduras. And you know what other Christian says? Well, you don't have faith in God. I said, yeah, I do. I have faith in God. I just don't have faith in all these other idiots that hate God. Because as we're going to see in a minute, the Bible tells us to resist the devil. It's a command that if someone tries to harm you, if someone tries to hurt you, you have a right to resist and not allow them to do that to you. Afterwards, the other missionary and I, we went out and we just... We just sat around and just we felt so violated that someone would break into your home and steal everything you have. They stole 11,000 lempiras, the whole entire church offering of that other missionary's church that they were going to use for the Lord. I don't know what happened to those robbers, but I'm sure God was watching. Probably got them. Probably got them. But you have a right to defend yourself from evil. The Bible teaches that. And you know what? History proves it, that if you do have arms, it saves people from being hurt. There's a country in the world today called Switzerland. In Switzerland, the law is every male head of a family has to have a rifle and a gun. And in Switzerland, everybody has to own uh, guns. There has to be a, a rifle and a pistol in working order in every person's home. Do you realize that Switzerland has never been in a war? <laughs> Why is that? Hitler took over Europe in World War II, and guess what he did? He said, oh, Switzerland, I think I'll go around this way and go around this way, and he did. Switzerland never got into World War II. Why? Because they looked at him and said, whoa, they got guns, they can defend themselves. No, 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 I don't, I don't want to go there. You see, when you have a right to defend yourself, and you have a gun to do it, guess what the criminals are going to think? I'm not going to take that chance. I think I'll go find the guy that doesn't have a gun. That's why gun-free zones are a really bad idea. You have a restaurant or you have a school or something, and right there in big letters, gun-free zone, what's a criminal saying? Ooh, wow, they can't defend themselves. I'm going to go get me some prey. <laughs> That's what's so stupid to advertise. No guns here. 
So according to the Bible, you have a right to defend yourself. But people say, well, I'm afraid of guns. Well, you don't have to be. All over around this area where I live, you can't drive down the road without seeing signs. Gun class is here. Gun, concealed gun class here. All over there's people that are offering classes to teach you how to own a gun and be able to walk around with it as a concealed carry. And so you don't have to walk around in fear all the time. Well, that's what's so sad is people fear guns rather than fearing the criminals that use them. But you know what? When you own a gun, that fear goes away because you feel like, well, if somebody's going to come get me, at least they're going to know I put up a fight. And you don't have to cower down and say, oh, I'm so scared. You feel like, well, at least I have a fighting chance against evil. <laughs> so what does the Bible say about self-defense? Well, we looked at in the beginning, God proved that you have a right to defend your life, defend your property. He used a flaming sword, which is like a firearm today. Under the law. If someone breaks into your house and you kill them, it's justified because they had no right to do that. You see, they lost every right that they had when they broke the law and entered into your private property. And when they went there to kill you, you were justified in defending yourself so that they couldn't take your life from you. In Jesus' time, Jesus said, go buy a sword. He said, sell everything you have and go buy it. Why? Because we're supposed to defend ourselves. Now, today we're in this time period, a time of grace. And today, if you've watched my other videos, you can tell we're under the Apostle Paul. He is our Apostle. What does Paul say? Well, actually, Paul doesn't say much about owning a gun. Matter of fact, Paul doesn't say anything about it. How about a sword? Well, Paul talks about a sword. But Paul's ministry, he was more about the spiritual than the physical. So in Paul's ministry, Paul could care less if a person had a sword or not. For him, the things that were physical were nothing. All Paul cared about was winning people to Jesus Christ. So when Paul talks about a sword, he talks about a spiritual sword. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Now I'm not saying that that doesn't mean that today we can't own a gun. Or we can't defend ourselves. We have a right to self-defense today under Paul as they did under the law. But look what Paul says about it. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 18, we have what's called the uh, armor of God. Therefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So under Paul, it's all about standing. Almost sounds like a stand your ground, doesn't it? But he says stand for truth. We're supposed to stand for the truth. So even though that's a spiritual teaching, doesn't that also sound like that would apply to a physical thing as well? That if you have a right to stand for the gospel and preach it and stand in spiritual things, shouldn't you have a right in the physical to stand as well? Of course. But then he says, uh, I'll just go ahead and read down verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So according to Paul, the sword for today is the Bible. So according to Paul, the most important thing in this time period is this sword, the Word of God. And because of that, many Christians today say, see, a Christian shouldn't own a gun. Oh, wait a minute. If God the Father showed that it's okay to own an arm, if Jesus Christ himself said it's okay to own an arm, if the Old Testament law said you have a right to self-defense, doesn't that right still apply today? Or did God say, well, I'm just going to forget it. Uh, you don't have the right to defend yourself anymore. Uh, no, no, I don't think so. It, it still applies as it continues on. And we're going to look about after this time period about the rights that people have as well. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, a lot of people say, look at this verse, look at this verse. And a lot of Christians today try to preach, a Christian has no right to own a gun or defend himself. You know what's sad is many of those so-called Christians, they aren't working for God, they're working for the government. Whether you know it or not, there's a lot of FEMA preachers out there, a lot of preachers that work for the government, that are actually paid by the government to preach against owning guns. Isn't that sad? Well, they're not preaching the Bible because what I'm preaching to you today shows, yeah, you have a right to own a, own a, own a something, own a weapon to defend yourself. 
2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 4 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So Paul says there is a spiritual warfare. And our weapons in this warfare, this spiritual one, are not carnal. Okay, so that's the war for the gospel. But every day you walk, and when you walk in this life, you still have a right to defend your your body, to defend your flesh, to defend yourself from evil. But Paul put the emphasis more on the spiritual than the physical. And because of that, there are many verses where Paul goes around and talks about the spiritual warfare. And he talks about the striving and the standing. Look at what he says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 7. And then we'll read verse 17. Philippians 1, 7. Even as meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, and so much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Paul said, you know, for me, the most important thing is defending the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, we've looked at it many times before. The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So you're saved by trusting the gospel. You trust what Jesus Christ did for you when he died and rose again. Why did he die? He shed his blood for your sins. And so you trust the gospel, you're saved. And then there's a warfare that you enter into as a Christian that is a spiritual warfare. And that spiritual warfare is a spiritual thing in which you defend the gospel. Now, I was uh, listening to the news the other day, and there was this woman that's on one of these talk shows during the daytime. And she said, oh, uh, Christians are horrible. Christians have a great history of violence and killing people. And I thought to myself, that's so sad. That poor woman didn't have a clue what she was talking about. You see, the history of violence in the name of Jesus was by the Catholics, the Crusades. But those weren't Christians. There has always existed from the time of Paul and Jesus to today true Christians that don't believe in going out and murdering and killing people. So yes, there's a history of violence in Catholicism, but not true Christianity. Because true Christians were persecuted by the same Catholics who went out and killed Muslims and killed other people. So don't give me that garbage that, oh, Christians are just violent, horrible people. No, 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 no. Catholics are not Christians. Or you can go to Cloud Church and look up uh, under why I'm not serious, why I'm not a Catholic. Because Catholicism is a church that was started about 300 years after Jesus that has the wrong roots, that has the wrong doctrine, that has the wrong teaching, and it glorifies a man above Jesus. So I'm not a Roman Catholic. And I do not believe that Christians should go out and cite violence. And I read the Bible, I don't see it there. Nowhere in the writings of Paul, and we're under Paul's ministry, not Peter, as the Catholic Church would try to teach you. Under Paul's ministry, nowhere does Paul say, now if you're a Christian, go out and kill people. It's not there. Nowhere does Jesus say, if you're a Christian, go kill people. And it's not there. So anyone that says, I'm a Christian, and goes and murders other people, has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt, he is not a Christian. So don't tell me that Christians are violent and murderers. They're not. Now, <clears throat> with that stated, here's the thing. In this church age, in this time period in which we live, some people have said, well, the Bible says you don't have a right. You don't have a right to own a gun. You don't have a right to defend yourself. Well, what does the Bible say? Let's go to 2 Timothy. Because the same Paul that told us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal is the same Paul that said this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And what he did is he, he kind of told us about what's going to happen in the last times. I'm going to preach a message very soon about are we in the last days. If you get a chance, look that up on YouTube or at the Cloud Church. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 1, look at what it says. Paul is speaking to Timothy, and Paul says, Know this, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now this is the last days of the church age, so right around here, the time right before the rapture of the church. Over here is the battle of Armageddon, and this of course is the millennial thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. So right before the rapture of the church, right before Jesus comes for his bride, the Bible says in these last days, 
Watch what he says. There will be perilous times. What does it mean, perilous times? Well, let's read what it says. Perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, what? Turn away. So we're to turn away from such people. But what if we turn away and they still come after us? If we're living in times, these last days that are perilous, which I, I believe we live in, all over the news is ISIS trying to take over the world. And what is ISIS? It cuts people's head off. That's pretty perilous, isn't it? And you have people, gangs, and you have uh, all over uh, open borders coming from the south. They want to kill people. If ever there was a time in the history of the world when a person should own a weapon for self-defense, it's today. Because today we're in those perilous times. And you say, no, no, we need to get rid of guns. Oh, oh, so in the most perilous of times, with the most murders and the most killings, the most rapes, that's when we should say, oh, here, take our guns, and now someone please come kill me? That's ridiculous! That's like taking a newborn baby into the heart of Africa and saying, okay, baby, I hope you make it, while you're hearing lions rocking around in a circle and growling because they're hungry. That's ridiculous. But that's what you do when you tell a person you don't have a right to defend yourself and take away their guns, especially when you do it in the last days when the history is more perilous than any other time of history. And Paul says, yeah, it's that, it's that time. I'm going to read some more from this chapter, 2 Timothy 3, verse, verse 9. But they, they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be made manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. It's a folly to tell a person they have no right to defend themselves. And you can see their folly by looking at all the nations on the globe where they've taken away people's guns. Crime has increased and skyrocketed. More murders, more deaths, more evil. Just look at Chicago, Illinois. The strictest gun laws in America are in Chicago, Illinois. And guess what? Most murders. I remember when I was growing up, they said the worst place in America was Gary, Indiana, had the most crime. Suburb of Chicago. And there in verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Who are these evil, wicked people after? Christians, the godly. So if you're a godly Christian, those people are going to look at you and say, I want to kill you. And who are those people? Well, just look at the Muslim extremists. Who, by the way, they don't want to call terrorists. But they terrorize Christians all over the Middle East as ISIS went in and took over. They murdered and slaughtered Christians left and right. So who do you think are the persons on the hit list? Christians. So who should have a right to own arms for self-defense? Christians. Why? Because their very book, the Bible, tells them. And the prophecy of what will happen in these last days tells us, now more than ever, we should be prepared to defend ourselves from evil. Because evil is coming. It's like the floodgates have opened and the hordes of hell are running towards you. And you ought to say, okay, I'm ready to stand my ground, just like David's man back in 2 Samuel. And I don't want to do it. I don't want to kill anybody. I don't want to harm anybody. But when someone comes with the intent to harm you, you have every right to defend your wife and defend yourself, defend your children from that evil. Look at verse uh, 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Verses 15 and 16, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be, thoroughly, uh, uh, be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, in evil, wicked, ungodly times, when evil men shall wax worse and worse, what's the answer? taking away all of people's right to self-defense and let those evil people murder and slaughter them? Or saying, no, we're going to help the innocent to defend themselves from the evil. That's the answer, because that's the Bible answer. So if ever there was a time to own a gun to defend yourself from evil, it's today. Because the Bible says we are in those perilous, perilous times. 
Paul doesn't say much about self-defense. In fact, it sounds like he was a little more interested in the spiritual things, and so he doesn't talk about self-defense. Now, let's go to Romans 13, because that's what many people like to preach nowadays, and say, well, you are so wrong, Mr. Breaker. Oh, you are just so wrong. Oh, you just want to incite violence. Once again, I am not inciting violence. I am not telling or instructing anyone to go hurt anyone. God forbid that you should ever have to hurt someone. But God forbid a thousand times over that someone should try to hurt you. So, what many people do is they say, well, Paul, your guy Paul, he wrote Romans 13. And in Romans 13 it says, let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So, if the government says you can't own guns, then Mr. Breaker, you have to get rid of them. Okay, well let's read the rest of the context, okay, to see. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist, resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Oh, you can't resist anything the government says. They're of God. Are they of God? Let's read the rest. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. God ordained the powers that be, but he ordained them to do what? To be a terror to evil. What happens when the so-called powers that be are the evil ones and you're the good one? Well, we know what happened because we saw what happened in the 1700s. The United States of America was founded by Christians that were oppressed by King George. And King George took away right after right after right after right and encroached upon them and he said, whether you think that's your home or not, I have a right to put a soldier in your house against your will. And so the people that lived in the colonies at that time said, this is horrible, this is unbearable. Every right that the Bible says we have, this tyrant, King George, is taking away from us. And the last straw was when he said, nope, you have to surrender all your arms and give us all your powder. They said, we can't do that. They said, we have to resist the devil. Because you see, the Bible says the powers that be are ordained of God, and they are a terror to good works. So if the powers that be turn against God and the Bible, then they're no longer the powers that be. See, look at the verse 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. So if he's doing evil, then he's no longer of God for good, is he? Then he's evil. Old Franklin, uh, Benjamin Franklin said, resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. Why would he say that? Because if there is a power that's ordained of God that's a ruler, then it should be just. If it is a tyrant and is an oppressive tyrant, then it is the right of the people to overthrow him so that we can indeed live right under a righteous government. Now, I'm not telling you to overthrow the government. I'm just using an example of history of why America was founded. And guess what? America became the greatest nation the world has ever known. Why? Because they said, we want to follow this book. You see, a righteous government, a moral government, produces a righteous and moral people. An immoral government produces an immoral and unrighteous people. So, if the government's moral, then the nation will be moral, and things will be great, and there won't be perilous times. But when a nation, the government becomes corrupt, the people become corrupt. And that's when perilous times come. And in those perilous times, more than ever, do we need that right to defend ourselves from evil. In Nazi Germany, they had the KJB. The KJB could come to your house at 4 in the morning, grab you, haul you off somewhere, and you'd never be seen again. What happened to you? Many of them were tortured to death. And you tell me that that's ordained of God? I don't think so. In an immoral government, for example, Russia, after World War II, Russia took its old soldiers that fought and won against Hitler, brought them back to Russia and put them in concentration camps and killed them because the Russian government was afraid that they would fight against their tyranny and overthrow them. And you're telling me that that's of God? That God wants that? That God wants an immoral government to kill people and hurt and harm and steal? Frederick Bastier wrote years ago in the 1800s a book called The Law. If you've never read it, read the book called The Law by Frederick Bastier. Bastier. I don't know how you pronounce his last name. I call him Bastier. And in that book, he says the problem with the world is that righteous men take over a government, and then those who inherit it are unrighteous. And what they do is they change the laws. 
And he said most of the time they change from God's laws to immoral and corrupt men's laws. And when they do that, he coined the term, they're guilty of legal plunder. In other words, what they do is they steal from people, but they say, oh, but it's legal because we passed the law that it's okay to steal. In America, it's okay to murder people. And they say, oh, but the law says I can do it. How? In abortion. You can go to an abortion clinic right now and murder your baby. Where is that baby's right to self-defense? Years ago, there was a, an evangelist that preached a message, and that message was, where is the most unsafe place in the world to live? And he said, you know, I thought it might be over in, in Africa someplace, or Mali, or, or Somalia. And he, he says, I looked all over the world, and he said, I finally, after doing all my study for weeks and weeks, he said, I found that the most unsafe place in the world to live is for a baby to live in his mother's womb in America. Over 4,000 babies a day are murdered in the United States of America by their own mothers who go to abortion clinics. That, imagine that poor, innocent child inside there thinking, man, this is wonderful. I'm just a growing. Oh, look, that wasn't there yesterday. Now it's grown a little bigger. And all of a sudden, what's going on? What's going on? And you know how they do abortions? There's three or four different ways, but one of the main ways is they take a vacuum and they put in scissors and they start cutting up the fetus and then they vacuum it out in parts. You imagine being inside your mother's womb thinking, boy, I'm just so safe. This is wonderful. What's that? What's that? Ah, ah, the scissor cuts off your leg. What? What's going on? Cuts off your head and they vacuum you out and throw you in a dumpster. Oh, well, if that was all that happened, that'd be horrible. But guess what? That's not even how evil the world is. It's coming out on the news today that the people that do the abortions, then they go and sell the baby parts. They get rich off of selling body parts of those that they've slaughtered. That's sick. Where's that baby's right to self-defense? Man, it makes you want to puke. Paul doesn't say much about self-defense. He said, my ministry is more about this right here, the spiritual warfare. That's why Jude says in Jude chapter 3, that we should earnestly contend for the faith. I want to read it to you. Jude chapter 3. If I can find Jude here. Right before Revelation, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. God gave us a message to preach the gospel. And we have a right to teach it. We're supposed to earnestly contend for that. That's our spiritual battle as Christians. But in these last days, they're seeking to kill Christians. So what do we have in the flesh? We have a right in the flesh to resist those that would try to harm us. And according to the Bible and to God and to Jesus Christ, we have a right to bear arms for self-defense. And guess what? Go to the book of James. The book of James chapter 4 tells us this. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Now watch what it says. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We have to resist the devil. Now, if you've seen my other videos, there's a video on YouTube and also the Cloud Church. Look it up, what the Bible says about the New World Order. According to the Bible, and we see it being formed today, there will be a one world government in the future in which the Antichrist shall rule and reign. And according to the Bible, his plan is to make everyone take a mark in their right hand or in their forehead so that the devil can take over the world. And that's going to happen right after the rapture. Matter of fact, let me uh, take you to that. Well, actually, let me back up. I always get ahead of myself. 1 Peter chapter 5 is another verse real quick that I want to read. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a walking, a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So the Bible says that the devil, which is who is the Antichrist, is seeking to devour you. And today, in these last days, these perilous times, he's building his kingdom. And as he's doing it, he's taking over. And he's already taken over the United States of America. He's also taken over all the other countries of the world. And through the United Nations, the UN, the devil is setting up his kingdom. 
And you know what he's going to do? He's going to kill as many people as he can that won't go along with that agenda. And the Bible tells us, resist the devil. So were the founding fathers terrorists, as Penny tried to say today? No, as a matter of fact, they were freedom fighters, and they looked at it as, okay, we have to defend ourselves from tyranny. King George is a tyrant, and he is no longer ordained of God. He is of Satan, because what he's doing to us is against God in the Bible. So how can he be a minister of God when he's doing the things that God said not to do? So the founding fathers said, we will defend ourselves. And they stood on that hill. They stood their ground. They resisted the devil at the Battle of Bunker, Bunker Hill. And they fought a long war. And it was sad. And it was horrible. And many people died. But they gained their freedom from tyranny. They weren't for stinking terrorists. They were people that said, we want God to be in charge of us. Not a man who's serving Satan. And what did they do? They sat down and they wrote the Constitution of the United States of America. And what did it say? It said that God, the Creator, gave us certain unalienable rights. And that every man has a right to live according to his conscience. Well, let me close with this, talking about this New World Order kingdom, because we live in a day and age of a New World Order. Now, I'm not telling you to go fight the New World Order. I, I, you do not take this message and say, well, he told me I can go kill people. I am not telling you to kill anyone. All I'm saying is this message is a, a biblical message teaching that God says we that are Christians have a right to own something as a weapon to defend ourselves from those that want to do us harm. Because the Bible over and over and over tells us that these are perilous times and that there are people that want to harm us. And we don't have to allow it. We resist it. We fight against it. We turn away from such evil and harm against us. Revelation chapter 13 verse 11 through 18 it says, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like in a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Twelve. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that would dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Thirteen. And he doeth great wonder, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of all men. Fourteen. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them they should dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. Fifteen. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. You see, this is talking about this time. The Antichrist, the beast, the devil, will kill anybody that does not take the mark of the beast. That's why it's so great to be saved, to trust the gospel, so that you don't have to go through this time. But if you miss the rapture and you're left behind, you have a choice. Take this mark or resist. And to resist means one of two things. You either die of starvation because you don't have a mark to buy or sell. Starvation. Or you are going to be beheaded by the state. Because the Bible teaches us that in this time, anybody that doesn't bow down to the Antichrist, the devil, and take that mark, will be, be, be beheaded. In verse 16, he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. In verse 18 tells us that it's the number 666. Now, all throughout history, God has had a chosen people. And God chose Adam and Eve, but they sinned. And so God used something to defend what belongs to Him. Over here under the law, God says, you know, it's not wrong to use a weapon to defend. It's actually justified. Self-defense is justified, and God allows it. Over here, Jesus Christ said, look, buy a sword. And they said, well, we have two of them. God said, okay. So it's not wrong for a Christian to own a gun, to own a sword, to own a weapon. And what's it for? It's not to go murder in cold blood as some religions do. It's to be able to say, look, I have this in my own home, so that when the evil men who are waxing worse and worse come to kill me, I can defend myself and my wife and my kids. Now, if you miss the rapture, there'll be a time in which you have a right to defend yourself from the Antichrist, but guess what? He'll have the whole world under his thumb. And he'll have everyone so deceived that if you're one of those that says, I won't do it, then they say, you have a choice. You either take the mark or... 
And if you want to be saved in that time period, you're going to have to say no and allow yourself to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. If you get a chance, go to Cloud Church and look up past sermons because they've got sermons there, how to be saved in the tribulation. If you miss the rapture, how to be saved. And you know how you're going to have to be saved in the tribulation? Give your life rather than take the mark. Now, look at this. Zechariah chapter 12. A lot of people say, well, I'm a Christian, but I can't see how God would allow the devil to rule and reign on this earth and have his kingdom. Well, there's a reason for it. But before we look at that reason, let's go to Zechariah chapter 12 and see what the Bible says in the future. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, and the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come up against Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that in this time, even though the whole world is deceived, God's still going to take his nation Israel and save a remnant. And God's going to defend them. God's going to defend Israel. And he's going to come back, and all the nations of the world will come and say, no, we want, we want Jerusalem. And the Antichrist will come in and sit down on the throne and say, I am God. And God says, really? Really? And once the devil has everyone under him, he's going to come back and say, okay, the ultimate self-defense, God, me, defending my people Israel. And he'll come back at the battle of Armageddon. And look what the Bible says in Zephaniah. This is so amazing. You see, if you work for the United Nations, you're on the losing side. The United Nations is the force of Satan to bring in the new world government. And they're going to lose. Well, they might win for seven years, that tribulation period. But they're not going to win forever. Here's what Jesus said in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that they may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. God says, okay, United Nations, you set yourself up an assembly. And you think it's you assembling? God says, it is my determination to gather them that I may assemble them. Assemble the kingdoms. And the purpose that God allows this devil and these kingdoms and these nations to unite is so they'll all be in one place when he comes back at Armageddon. And it'll be easier to destroy them all in one place than if they were in all different places. And that's what the Bible teaches. So if you're a Christian... You don't have to worry about that. You won't be there. The Bible says that we go out at the rapture before the tribulation. And, in fact, we that are Christians will come back with Jesus Christ, which is quite an amazing thing, and we will fight with Him at the battle of Armageddon. Now, I'm going to close with Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 4. I'm sorry if I've gone a little long. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 4 says, And He shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. Now, this is talking about Jesus Christ in the millennium. He shall judge among the nations, rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So over here in the Millennium Kingdom, there won't be any more swords or guns. Why? Because it's a time of peace in which Jesus Christ rules and reigns for a thousand years. But here... This is the last days. This is the perilous times. This is when we need them the most to defend ourselves from evil. But over here, there won't be any need for self-defense because Jesus Christ will be on earth literally and He will defend people. And in the Millennial Kingdom, there will be no need. And you know why that's interesting? Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 4. The reason this is interesting is because you go to the United Nations today in New York City, and out front of the United Nations, they have this Bible verse. Beat your swords into plowshares. And the United Nations today is trying to set up their false kingdom, and they want to take all your guns. And what are they going to do? They're going to force you against your will to bow the knee to Baal. So they take this verse that says Jesus is going to do, and they're trying to steal Jesus' kingdom. And they try to play God. 
That's why the United Nations is such an evil and wicked and ungodly organization. And the Bible is very plain that that is set up for God to come back and destroy. So there it is. There's the message on self-defense. I don't know how to make it any plainer. Do we as Christians have a right to bear arms? Yes, twofold over, because the Bible says so and the Constitution says so. We have a right to defend, just as God defended what was His, the Garden of Eden. We have a right to defend our homes and our lives. And the Bible says when you do that, just like in the Old Testament law, you shouldn't go to jail for self-defense. You shouldn't be killed if you kill someone who breaks into your home or tries to kill you. If it's self-defense, it's justified. Jesus told you, sell your purse and your script and buy a sword. If you're a Christian and you don't have a gun, you ought to get one. And let me give you some counsel. If you have children, you ought to get one and put it in a safe so that the kids can't get it. So you avoid having problems. In this day and age of Paul, there's a spiritual warfare going on. And that's why more than ever is there a need in these perilous times for us to defend ourselves from evil. And to try to tell a person you don't have a right to self-defense and try to take away a person's guns like the progressives and the communists do is to aid and abet the kingdom of Satan and to be an aider and an abetter to the murder of poor Christians. And someday there will be no need for a sword. And that's when Jesus Christ rules in white reigns. And that's the day that I look for. Well, I hope this has been an edification to you. Uh, many Christians have asked me, asked me to make this video, and here it is. Does the Bible teach self-defense? It does. And that's why it's in the Constitution. Because the Founding Fathers read the Bible and said that's one of those inalienable rights that we have from the Creator. The right to bear arms. Why? To defend ourselves from evil men who will wax worse and worse. So let me close this by saying, in no way whatsoever is this sermon going against the laws that are on the books. In no way am I being anti-government through this sermon. In no way am I instructing people to go kill other people of another faith or anything like that. This sermon has just been to be edifying. What does the Bible teach on this subject? I hope you've learned from it, and I hope you'll keep in mind what the Bible teaches, and I hope you'll do everything you can to keep from hurting other people. You know, history proves the more guns that a people have, the less crime, because criminals are afraid to prey upon the people. So I hope this has been an informative video, and I hope it shows you what the Bible teaches about this subject. So thanks for watching. God bless. We'll see you next time.